the beginning of May, Kensington Palace on election night. The Princess of Wales, watching the results come in on television, can barely contain her glee. A new dawn has broken, has it not? The man she'd had dinner with that night, one of her closest friends, was now at Labour's victory party at the Royal Festival Hall. We were on the phone about eight, ten times, she was rejoicing at the win, and she was really over the moon. She was up till five in the morning watching it. She told me she'd met Blair on a few occasions before, and uh, she was very much looking forward to him winning. With what she called those ghastly conservatives now gone, as well as new Labour, there was also a new Diana. As she strode the world stage, her fresh confidence was obvious. This is how she's remembered since her death. Beautiful, independent, compassionate, liberated. It was a kind of new beginning in her life, and she had decided to do different things, and she was feeling free to talk to me, really. Well, she didn't feel that she was treated right by the establishment, and she felt as if she's out of the cage. Certainly when I was with her in August, the resurrection had begun and was completing its course. But the last few months of her life were also controversial and often chaotic. Single again, divorced from the court, Diana was a princess on the loose. There's no doubt that those who care about the royal family are very worried, I think, in the last few months as to what this girl will get up to. I mean, she seemed capable of anything. She seemed reckless, almost demented. Princess Diana was potentially a, a threat to the establishment and a threat to the royal family. I think in the end she didn't give a stuff about the establishment. It was Prince William's idea. In early June, Diana announced she was going to New York to sell dozens of the dresses she'd worn when married to Charles, the money to go to charity. The princess was shedding a skin. The clothes represented the past, and she was looking to the future. And on the night of the auction, when she came over to me to talk to me, she I said something like, it's, it's the past and now everything's got to stand for itself. And there was something about her that said, look, I've got to make a change in my life. I can't just drift along in the same way that I'm going. She'd had this divorce, she'd had all these clothes. Where would she want to wear these clothes with all these associations? 13,000, 14,000, 15,000, 16,000. Last time, at 62,000, yours 108. I think she saw this as a statement, as a change in her whole life, and as meaning that, yes, she was going to emerge as another sort of butterfly. Just as Diana decided to sell her dresses, she made an extraordinary offer to a French journalist. The newspaper Le Monde had asked her to select a favorite photograph for an article. Diana wanted to tell the reporter and the world that she was redefining her life. I don't know exactly the purpose and the reason why she accepted the interview, of course, maybe I, I never know completely, but really I had the impression that she really wanted to, to say different things and to show that she was, she was comfortable with, with her life and determined. And the way she said that now nobody could say her what to do and impose her different things. She said, I'm my best advisor. As they sat in Diana's living room, the princess looked through a series of photographs of herself before selecting as her favorite a shot from a trip to Pakistan. I asked her, well, this is a very uh, tender picture, in a way, very warm picture. And she said, well, this is so important to touch. I do care for that, and I think people like like that, they like to be touched at any, you know, any time in your life, you need that kind of thing, and I always do that. And I said, well, this is not the way that a lot of people do, or royals, or, you know, other people, or very famous people, and she said, well, that's the way I always did. I think it's so important. But, you know, the, the day when I entered in my family, nothing could be done naturally. 
I remember one evening we were having dinner at a private club called Harry's Bar. She said, why don't we go to Annabelle's tonight? Let's go there. Impromptu. It wasn't planned. It was dancing well. It was two in the morning. She loved dancing. Loved to be a free person, which she wasn't allowed to do when she was married. In Angola, the previous January, the princess had been criticized for highlighting the issue of landmines. The Tories were still in power, and she was accused of meddling in politics. But with the new Labour government now making encouraging noises, Diana determined to make it a personal crusade. Behind the scenes, a conservative lord tried to help her steer a path away from controversy. When she went to Angola, as you know, a British minister, minister attacked her and said that she was interfering and being political. The last thing she was being. I think she realized that if she was going to campaign on the ban, it would be political, it would be controversial. At a speech in London on June the 12th, she shared a platform with one of Tony Blair's new ministers, Claire Short, and made it clear that despite the criticism from some Tory politicians, she was not going to let the issue drop. She made a keynote speech, and I know exactly what the contents were because we worked together on it. And that keynote speech set out exactly where she stood on the issue of mines. Angola has the highest rate of amputees in the world. How can countries which manufacture and trade in these weapons square their conscience with such human devastation? Some people chose to interpret my visit as a political statement, but it was not. I am not a political figure, and as I said at the time, and I'd like to reiterate now, my interests are humanitarian. But the criticism didn't stop. The Daily Telegraph described the speech as an unusual gesture of support for the Blair administration. For the princess to put herself so overtly at the head of a political campaign to abandon all landmines and deprive our own soldiers of the use of such landmines uh, was, in my view, wrong of her. It wasn't just landmines that were getting the princess into trouble. On Prince William's birthday, a week and a half later, Diana decided to take her sons to the cinema near Kensington Palace. She no longer had royal protocol to guide her and didn't check the subject matter of the film, The Devil's Own. We spoke on the phone and she was crying. What happened? And she told me this. She took the boys to this uh, IRA movie and the press has found out. 97.3 FM. Princess Diana is being criticized for taking her sons to see a controversial pro-IRA movie to take the princes there without, I believe, any consultation with their father or with uh, the royal family as a whole was an impulsive gesture on the part of the princess. I don't think she knew what she was doing. She did a lot of things on impulse without discussing or consulting if she thought it was right for her. Go for it. It's one o'clock. I'm Joanna Gosling. Princess Diana has pulled out of a Commons Committee meeting on landmines in her second controversy this week. What is wrong, I suppose, is that she's called the Princess of Wales. She's quasi-royal, and we have had a royal family which, since the early 19th century, has steered very clear of politics, and a very good thing, too. It's a cross-party issue, this. Nothing to do with individual parties, and it's quite wrong to make it so, and frankly, I'm disappointed that any member should be so short of media coverage that they've got to descend to this level. I was very glad that she didn't go ahead with that meeting. I think it would have been overtly political. Uh, there was a great difference of opinion between the Conservative government and the successor government about landmines, and for the princess to take a stance in favour of one and against the other uh, would not have been a proper role for a member of the royal family. Diana put out a statement expressing her extreme disappointment and frustration, but her spirits revived when she got a call from Britain's new Prime Minister who had a proposition for her. Tony Blair invited her for Sunday lunch to offer her a role in some, of some form. So she said, I'm going to take William with me. So she took William on a Sunday. It was an informal affair at the Prime Minister's country retreat checkers. She'd got on well with John Major when he was Prime Minister, but Tony Blair wanted a more purposeful relationship. So I asked her after this uh, lunch, I said, if he asked you next time, what would you like to do? Diana, what would be your answer? Maybe you would leave it to you to suggest something. So what I'd really like to do is be a peacemaker, a mediator between 
countries were fighting each other, I believe I can really do that.